Hello. So I'm, I'm introducing Rob, uh, who I barely know. We just met how many? Uh, 31 years ago. Wow. Yeah? 1987, I was uh, looking around for a graduate program in <coughs> MIT, and among the other people were Rob. And and I can't get rid of him since then. So 31 years we were still together. So Rob went and got his uh, undergrad in Oberlin, and then moved and was a technician for a while at, at Le Monde Dory, and then moved to uh, MIT, which saw uh, John program in oceanography, where he did his PhD with Ed Boyle, who was also my advisor. So he was ahead of me a few years. But a good reason for me that I joined this program, he and others, and, 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 and then we were uh, office mates, and then we are essentially office mates <laughs> since then for many years. So um, we're all probably is one of the better. So any of you, I was just in, in, in China and Japan and looked at the clouds. Every cloud looked like a pharmacy, so clean. And I, I, I always tell them, look, you know, ours looks like a garage. I want to probably one of the, the stock house looks probably one of the, the, the most, uh, the best uh, analysts in trace metal. Uh, geochemistry certainly in, in, in particular, and, and I think you'll get the idea. So those of you that don't know, iron is really hard to do, and some of the trace metal, and Rob has probably one of the best experience in this field. So. Is that further due, Rob? Thank you, Yair. And I didn't realize that Judy is here. I was <laughs> Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm going to talk to you about the Amundsen Sea in West Antarctica today. Um, and some of the work that I realized that it's a little bit embarrassing how far some of this work goes back. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about my first trip to the Amundsen Sea, which was in 2007 and 8. But uh, the data that I'm showing here comes from a trip in 2010-11, so that's getting to be a while ago now. But the modeling work that I'm going to progress towards in this talk is work that's going on currently and part of a project that we're in actually still wrapping up. So I can tell you actually in one slide the most important message that I have for you today. It's not complicated. There. <laughs> That's it, okay? So tomorrow, you must vote. It's more important than anything I'm gonna say or anything we're gonna do today or this week or this month. And um, please, if you have any doubt that somebody in your family might not vote or that you know somebody who's apathetic, please get them out. Okay, actually, here are the key ideas. So if you're feeling sleepy, you can read this and then go to sleep and wake up at the end and you'll, you'll hear it in a different form. Um, some of this is absolutely things that most of you know or should know. Glacial ice is melting in West Antarctica. The rate of this melting is increasing. The Amundsen Sea is the epicenter of Antarctic melting. And the Amundsen Sea Polynya, if you don't know what a Polynya is, you will in a few minutes, uh, is the most productive coastal region around Antarctica. And the warm water that's responsible for the glacial melting is also, I'm going to show you, bringing iron a critical limiting nutrient into the euphotic zone of this polynia. And the source of this iron may not actually be the melting glacial ice itself, but still the flux of this iron may scale with the melting rate of the glacial ice. You'll see what I mean in a little while. Now, since observations are limited, a new high resolution physical model combined with an appropriate biogeochemical model can help us understand how this massive bloom works and in fact help us to begin to make predictions in the future about how it might change in its workings um, with future climate change and in increased melting. So here's the bottom of the world. Most of you have seen this kind of picture. Here's Antarctica surrounded by the Southern Ocean. And you can see that the Southern Ocean, this is chlorophyll, is low in productivity. Generally speaking, not as low as the central gyres up there, but variably low in productivity. Higher chlorophyll is shown in these coastal regions here in these sort of red blobs. And what these are are some of the 46 or so polynias around Antarctica. So a polynia 
is an area of open water that has the continent on one side and is surrounded by sea ice on the rest of, on the rest of it. And they tend to open up in the summertime. Sometimes they close completely in the wintertime, depending on which one you're talking about. Sometimes they stay open all year round. But when you open up the water, remove the sea ice, suddenly you have a wonderful combination for productivity because you allow the sunlight in. And um, if you have high enough nutrients, and we know for the macronutrients, nitrate, phosphate, silicate, the whole southern ocean has very high concentrations of those. What well, we know that it's lacking in general is the micronutrient iron, which gets added from some of these islands and platforms around here. You can see the wake of these expressed in productivity. This is, we now know, because iron is moving away from these shallow areas and uh, doing an iron fertilization experiment in parts of the Southern Ocean. This is happening very intensely in the Polinias. And uh, in West Antarctica as well, we have a tremendous amount of melting and increased melting. So here's a map of Antarctica. Here's the Western Antarctic Peninsula. This little embayment you see here is the Amundsen Sea. And these red dots refer to ice mass loss, glacial ice mass loss. You can see in some places in East Antarctica, there's actually glacial gain, but West Antarctica shows large losses. This little dot here is 5% over the years 1994 to 2012. So in the last few decades, West Antarctica has been losing a lot of glacial ice. And the epicenter for this is this Amundsen Sea embayment right here, which is blown up here. And you can see the flow speed of the glaciers that are draining into this pretty small area. It's only about 500 kilometers across there. And a good chunk of the ice in West Antarctica here is funneling into this embayment. And if you look at the change in the flow speed of these glaciers from 1996 to 2008, the red is all the highest rate of change. So not only are these flowing rapidly into the Amundsen Sea, but the rate at which they've been flowing has been increasing tremendously. And if you add all of these glaciers together that empty into the Amundsen Sea, that's this line right here, and you can see that it's increased from the 1970s, a little bit under 200 gigatons per year, up to getting close to double that, close to 350 gig gigatons per year as of this compilation in 2014. 360 gigatons is one millimeter of sea level rise. That's about like emptying three quarters of Lake Erie into the ocean every year. And so this embayment, Right now, global sea level rise is roughly three times that. So this little embayment in Antarctica is responsible for about a third of the global sea level rise right now. And the reason it's uh, melting so quickly is, and you heard some of this two weeks ago in Oscar's talk about the Western Antarctic Peninsula, it's because the Antarctic circumpolar current and this pink donut of warm water, which sits down below the surface, lurking below the surface, about 500 meters or so. And you can tell that this is the hottest water around Antarctica because it's pink. <laughs> and you know, we know pink water is warm. Now it's really hot for Antarctica, which means two degrees C. Okay, so this water is around Antarctica, but you can see it's only impinging on the continental shelf pretty much right here in West Antarctica. There's the peninsula. Here's the Amundsen Sea. Between the two is called the Bellingshausen Sea. And so the way this works is the upper circumpolar deep water, under the effect of winds and tilting of the isopycnals, actually invades on, this is the Amundsen Sea embayment. They take that little notch there and blow it up and turn it sideways, so north is up now. You can see it's got these troughs. The darker blue are troughs of deeper water that cut across the shelf, and these were uh, cut by these glaciers when they went all the way out to the shelf break in the last glacial period. So these are essentially dredged out channels left over from the last glacial period. And right now what they do is they channel the upper circumpolar deep water following, roughly speaking, these yellow arrows in towards these gray ice shelves. So these are all ice shelves, which are where the glacier comes out and it starts to float over, semi-float over the uh, seawater. And this warm water comes in, interacts with the cavity underneath these ice shelves, does some melting, and then comes out at a shallower depth. So the pink arrows here are the shallow circulation. And you can see there's kind of a coastal current, not surprisingly, that heads to the west. Here's the cross section of what it looks like. Here's the uh, upper circumpolar deep water coming in, doing melting largely down here 
but also up here thinning these ice shelves which makes them lose strength and lose icebergs more quickly and this is the process that's removing ice mass from the glaciers around West Antarctica. So um, combined with this, now I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to um, some of the modeling work that we've been doing. So I'm giving you a preview here of modeling output. This is very simple. This is the physical model only. This is work um, done by Pierre Saint Laurent, my collaborator at Old Dominion University. So here's the same embayment. You've been seeing these black lines of the bathymetry. So you can see the trough here, the trough here, and the trough here. Here's the dots and ice shelf, which I'll be talking a lot more about in a little bit. And what you see here is the model is set up so everything that's brick red here is circumpolar deep water. Here in blue, there's no circumpolar deep water and it's in units of parts per thousand. So there's 100%, 1,000 parts per thousand, zero is in blue. And you can just start the model and see, whoops, sorry, that's not right. See um, where the water goes and how it kind of moves onto the shelf. So this is a high resolution physical model and you can see the warm water. This is tracking along the bottom in towards and it's actually downhill across the shelf and impinging underneath these ice shelves all the way along. You can see the Datsun ice shelf here with its ice shelf edge and that dotted yellow line. This is tracing that water just with a spin up of one year and the warm water has already made its way underneath here and initiated melting. So if you carry this forward and you go to 2010, so let the model run for four more years, this is what you get to. And you see that the way the water has come in, it's come here along the troughs, especially along this central trough here, which is filled up. Otherwise, it's coming along sort of the eastern parts of the troughs. Now you've got a lot of warm circumpolar deep water underneath the ice shelves. And by this time, it's actually more red on the east than it is here. And that's because this water here has mixed. You can tell it's a little more orange than red. It's not quite as cold. Sorry, it's a little cooler. It's not quite as warm. So its power to melt the ice shelf is not as strong as it is over here. So the other thing about the Amundsen Sea is that it's an extremely productive area. I'll show you some stats in a minute. So here's the same embayment. This is the Polina called the Amundsen Sea Polina. It's got the ice shelves in the continent on one side. The gray is all sea ice. This is sort of an average, well, not an average, actually. This is a real satellite image for January 2011. Here's the Pine Island Polina, and it's separated physically, not just by sea ice, but buried in here is a huge iceberg that's been sitting grounded for years, moving slightly, and some other smaller icebergs that follow a shallow bank going here and they form a sort of a fence and they've got a lot of very firmly packed multi-year sea ice around them and they basically make a physical barrier between the physical between the Pine Island Polina and the Amundsen Polina. Um, so what you see is that every one of these ice shelves, the Dotson, the Getz, the Crossan, the Thwaites, uh, the Pine Island Glacier called the Pig, etc. impinge and all of these are accelerating in their melting. Right now there is a program spinning up in NSF. It's actually one of the three major thrusts of the polar programs at NSF, and that is uh, to study in a $25 million program with uh, scientists from the UK what's happening with the Thwaites in particular. And the reason they're targeting the Thwaites is that it's the fastest accelerating largest volume coming into this embayment. Uh, there are a lot of reasons not to study it as well. It's very difficult to get to because of all this sea ice, so you can't get a ship close to it very often. So we have spent our time working on the dots and ice shelf, um, which is not melting as fast as the Thwaites, but it has uh, some similar characteristics. So this is what the Amundsen Sea looks like. This picture, I took this picture at about 3 a.m. on a calm morning. It's about minus 6 degrees centigrade. And you can actually see some things that are characteristic of this Polina. First of all, in the distance, you can barely see, see those little things that look like mountains. Those are icebergs. That's that lineup of, we call, it, we call it iceberg graveyard, lined up. They're all stuck on the bank, stuck on the bottom, very, very slowly melting over years. And that's on the other side of that is the um, Pine Island Polina. You can also see this is a, a big flow of sea ice. So sea ice is often covering part of the Polina, but not all of it. It's not completely open water. And you can see new sea ice being formed here. I don't know if you can quite see it, but there's just a thin layer, a millimeter or two thick. 
And that just formed in the last few hours. This is called grease ice. This is the first stage of sea ice formation. So what you see is that Apollina is actually a sea ice factory as well, especially in the early part of the season because of the heat loss. Um, it's making sea ice like crazy and blowing it out to the edges. And, um, um, and that's part of the reason that Polinias are important for deep water formation as well, because they make the surface water more saline when the sea ice forms. Lots of life in the Amundsen Sea Polinia. We saw all these kinds of guys, especially when sea ice was present. And the reason there is so much wildlife there is because it's such an incredibly productive system. So the Amundsen Sea Polinia is unusual for all the Polinias around Antarctica. Um, it's the, the highest peak and seasonal mean of chlorophyll A, the highest primary productivity per area. It's got the greatest interannual variability in terms of the productivity as well, which is interesting. Um, it's got the largest declines in sea ice cover of all these polinias. So over the last few decades, the, the extent of sea ice cover and the timing of the sea ice cover has receded. And of course, it's experiencing all this rapid glacial um, input. So if you look at just primary productivity, the black line is the Southern Ocean as a whole. The thin black line is all the polinias. And this is the timing seasonally, a little bit later and definitely much more productive. The red line is the Amundsen Sea Polinia, much more productive than the average. And the blue line is the, essentially the size of the Polinia when it's open. So it opens up uh, pr quite strongly in November, December, getting into the austral summer, and then reaches its peak opening and then stays open and then crashes close and the sea ice closes in and almost makes the Polinia go away. The bloom, chlorophyll A, drops off a good bit before the Polinia closes up, which is one of our interesting questions. So we had a program that was funded by NSF with all of these people involved. So it was a very multidisciplinary program uh, to go to the Amundsen Sea and really do the first study of biogeochemistry in the Amundsen Sea that had ever been done. Geophysicists had been there, physical oceanographers. And you recognize some of the people here who were involved. Uh, there's me, there's Oscar, there's Silka. Some of you might remember Rachel Sippler, who was a student here. Uh, all of us have gotten a little older. Um, and what we did was we went and occupied for about three weeks, driving around this Polinia, doing a huge array of, of um, measurements, which I won't talk about. Uh, mostly, I'll just talk about a few of them today. And what you can see with our kind of rat's nest of a cruise uh, track here is that we had very high chlorophyll, indeed, verified at over 20 micrograms per liter. And PCO2 was drawn down below 100 ppm. So atmospheric CO2 is diving into this polynia with this huge concentration difference. And the main producer here was about 90% in the middle of the polynia, dominated by this colony, colony forming uh, primnesiophyte called Phaeocystis antarctica. And this is, what it, this is literally what it looked like. It was like a mill pond or a farming pond. I've never seen color of water like that in the ocean at all. It was extremely productive with very high concentrations. And one of the things that we did was my program, which was to collect samples for trace metals in this area, especially to look at the situation with respect to iron, but also with respect to other bioactive trace metals. So some of you might remember Kat Eswine, your student. She came on the cruise and helped out. Here's Silke Severman, and here are the two of us looking at some filters. And we uh, had this special trace metal clean rosette, which we deployed one aft sequentially with the ship's rosette so that we could get uncontaminated seawater samples. And um, this is just a quick summary of what we found for iron. So here's the embayment again. Here, the white outline is the approximate boundary of the Polinia while we were there. We occupied all these stations for trace metal collections. And here's all the iron profile data shown here um, for the middle of the Polinia. And what you can see is that the iron concentrations through mm, several hundred meters in the midwater here are relatively low, but not that low, about 0.3 nanomolar, um, which is moderately low for iron. And that's the winter water. So this is the water that forms in the winter time and occupies the middle of the water column. Up near the surface, I'm blowing up here. I'll talk about that in the middle. And down near the bottom, interestingly, all of these profiles go down to about 10 meters off the bottom. And all of them are tremendously but varyingly enriched in dissolved iron as they approach the bottom. 
Now you go to the top of the water column, you can't really see it here, so I blew it up. And again, it looks like there is a lot of variability. We know this is not analytical variability. This is real variability in the system. We're very good at measuring iron, and the error on these is about 1 or 2%. And uh, so there's a lot of variability. So right away, you get the sense that you're not in a uniform body of water, but something that may have a lot of short scale variability. However, right in the surface, if you go right up to the surface, and this is a shallow euphotic zone, so waters that are characteristic of the euphotic zone, right in this blue circle, with a couple of exceptions, all of these profiles come down to in the vicinity of 0.1 nanomolar. And most people who study trace metals and phytoplankton would tell you that most phytoplankton are going to be quite limited in their growth at uh, ambient concentration of 0.1 nanomolar. So that's interesting. And if you look at it in the mapping sense, um, <clears throat> here, here's all the stations we occupied. Obviously only a subset were occupied for trace metals. The surface dissolved iron concentration, the dark blue is about 0.1. A couple of them have a little bit higher, a couple of them about 0.2 in the green. Here's what the chlorophyll looked like. So you can see the bloom is really in the middle of the polynia and around the edges near the sea ice and especially down here near the dots and ice shelf face, we have lower productivity. So the bloom seems to be occurring in the middle of the polynia and most of these stations have very low iron. Here's some higher iron right down near the ice shelf face. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But that's not where the bloom is. So we have kind of a mystery in a way here. Uh, we have low iron but very high chlorophyll. <clears throat> so one of our colleagues, uh, Anna Alderkamp, who was at Stanford at the time, uh, did some incubation experiments uh, with a lot of labor. So there's a huge experiment, and I'm just showing you a little part of it here. Uh, artificially adding iron to some bottles and not adding iron to others. And just to summarize what she found for this particular station here, we call this station 35, the one in the yellow circle there. And this one was unique because it had Actually, the very surface was drawn down to the lowest macronutrient concentrations we found for the whole polynia. So this is a very high productivity station, or at least high chlorophyll. And what she found in a nutshell is that even when she didn't add iron, if you put the water in a bottle and incubate it at appropriate light levels, the iron is drawn down to, uh, draws down the nitrate, sorry, the phytoplankton draw down the nitrate to in four to eight days, depending on what depth within the euphotic zone you take it. So you isolate the water, and there's enough iron present to draw down the nitrate to zero, and yet there was only 0.1 nanomolar of dissolved iron there to begin with. So if you do the math with any kind of reasonable iron requirement for phytoplankton, it suggests that, um, that these phytoplankton are either growing at extremely low iron requirements, or the iron is coming from somewhere else in these bottles. And so, the conundrum here is dissolved iron very low, biomass is very high. The bloom peak, we know from remote sensing, is still two to four weeks in the future. So we're, we were sampling in the rise of the bloom. And these bottle incubations show total nitrate drawdown, whether you add iron or not, in four to eight days. So why is the bloom not drawing nitrate down below seven micromolar anywhere? Almost everywhere is above 10 micromolar. So the phytoplankton appear to be iron stressed and the photophysiology indicated that as well. And the photosynthetic rate is lower than optimal but the bloom is continuing to grow and accumulate, make this very high chlorophyll growing over eight to 10 weeks, a very long lasting bloom. And during most of this time, the grazers are essentially absent from the euphotic zone. So what's supplying iron that keeps this weeks long bloom going? This is a central question for us. So here are the candidates. First of all, I'll just say right off the bat that um, the iron supply cannot be from atmospheric dust. There's simply too little. Many people have looked at this. So in other parts of the ocean, the atmospheric dust can keep the iron supply going for the phytoplankton. Not here. And it also can't be sea ice melting. And we saw that in our iron distributions. Yes, there is some different phytoplankton um, assemblage right near the edges of the plane near the sea ice and a little bit higher iron, but that iron has nothing to do with the central bloom that's in the middle of the polynia. So the candidates are uh, the first one, which has been sort of the assumption for a couple of decades about coastal Antarctica in general, and that is that the upper circumpolar deep water that's coming from off the shelf carries its complement of iron, which is about 0.4 nanomolar, 
onto the shelf and then upwells somewhere on the inner shelf and brings that iron up to the euphotic zone. So that's an idea that we've got to consider. The other possibility is glacial meltwater. We know we're melting the glaciers and glacial ice does have some iron in it. It's made from snow, which has gathered iron aerosols out of the atmosphere and piled them up on Antarctica. And thousands of years later, that ice might show up as a glacier in, in um, the Amundsen Sea and carry its iron with it into the water when it dissolves. The other possibility is sedimentary inputs. Do we have a mechanism by which iron from the sediments on this shelf zone can get up to the euphotic zone? So what I'm testing here is that the circulation of the circumpolar deep water underneath the ice shelves cause, that causes the glacial melting within the cavity is continuously supplying the iron that keeps the bloom going. So the presence of all these ice shelves is critical to the productivity of this polynia. And that's very different from the Western Antarctic, Penin Antarctic Peninsula that Oscar talked about two weeks ago. Because only in the very southern part of the peninsula are there any significant ice shelves and any kind of comparable mechanism involving cavities under ice shelves. So to test this idea, one of the things that we did in this cruise is to do what we call the iron curtain sampling section. We went in the course of one night. We skirted the boat quite close to the ice shelf face. So this is the Dotson ice shelf. You can see it's about 60 meters high. You can't really get a scale here, but that's you know 200 feet high. And inland there is the rest of the glacier going about 60 kilometers inland. And we took samples at these black dots along here. <clears throat> that's all we had time to do. And so we went from here to here, just about 30 or 40 kilometers across the ice shelf face. And what we found was this. First of all, uh, this diagram up here is showing you the water flow. So this was the ADCP showing the flow going in under the cavity. What you're doing here is you're within the cavity looking outward at a curtain of flow. And the blue water is coming at you into the cavity. And the yellow water and the red water is going out, out of the cavity. <clears throat> and what you can see here is that the water is doing, roughly speaking, in a somewhat heterogeneous way, what we would expect. Coming in deep and on this side into the ice shelf cavity, and then going out shallow and fast on the western side, up near the draft of the ice shelf. So that's the bottom of the ice shelf, and it's deeper over here than here, uh, partly because this has been melted by the warm water going out, so it's only about 150 feet 150 meters deep there. We did this by taking the side scan uh, multi-beam and having the sonic beams intersect the, the face of the ice shelf underneath the water and get us not just bottom depth, but the draft of the ice shelf. Now, we took samples at these four stations, these four lines here. Um, and station 60 is that red one there. And you can see we found some unusual chemistry for the water that's coming out right in the corner there. First of all, that is a very strong blob of water heading out. It's about 0.16 fur drips. So that's actually equivalent to the outflow of the Amazon River, amazingly enough. This is an Amazon River of water coming out from the western upper corner of this cavity. And it's coming out at about 150 to 300 meters. So the dotted line shows you that interval, that depth interval. Dissolved iron is here, particulate iron here, and meltwater fraction is there. So you can see in the red line that the station that's right over there on the corner has a lot more dissolved iron, about 0.7 nanomolar, than the other stations that are shown in the blue and, blue and the purple here. However, these other stations show the typical increase with dissolved iron towards the bottom. So that's an interesting increase, but if you think about where this water is coming from, it's water that came in here, interacted with and melted the glacier a little bit, got fresher and therefore more buoyant and shot out there at a shallower depth. So in some ways what we're doing is we're collecting water from down here and shooting it out up there. So it's maybe not too surprising that dissolved iron is higher. It doesn't have to be active melting of the glacier. We could just be taking some of this iron, which is presumably coming out of the sediments, put it together with some melt water, make it more buoyant and shoot it out and we would get dissolved iron at about that concentration. So maybe we don't need a glacial dissolved iron source at all. But when you look at the particulate iron, <clears throat> it's really striking. Here's less than a nanomolar. 
Here's almost 100 nanomolar of particulate iron suspended in the water. And it shows a peak right at the output, very different from these other stations. Not only that, but we chemically treated some of these particles when we collected them with a weak acid leach. And we showed that about 30% of this is not just crushed up rock. It's forms of iron that can pretty easily exchange with the dissolved form of iron. And over here is showing you just that the meltwater is also greatest. So this is glacial meltwater at roughly 1.5% within the outflow and less at the other stations. So we looked at this a little bit more in detail to try and figure out what other elements might be varying that might give us a clue as to source the sources of dissolved and, and particulate iron. So on the left is just turbidity optically determined. So you can see here's the interval from about 150 to a little over 300 meters and you can see that there, this corresponds to quite a few more suspended particles. Not down here, but right up at the surface. And concomitant with that is this high, but kind of straight up and down dissolved iron signature. But if you look at the green line, that's dissolved manganese. And manganese shows a pretty strong peak right in the middle here. Now that's interesting because iron and manganese can both have a sedimentary source, but the solubility of iron can be limited Iron's not very soluble in seawater, and it's mostly, its concentration is determined primarily by the concentration of dissolved organic ligands that can keep it in solution. So the iron might run up against a solubility limit with the organic ligands, but manganese has nothing like that going on. No organic ligands, nothing. So the manganese peak here might tell us what the iron would be doing if it could tell us its true, true story and didn't have its solubility limited by available ligands. The interesting thing is there's a little bit of a tick up here in dissolved copper. And when we look over to the particulate, here's the iron again that you just saw at almost 100 nanomolar. Uh, the green, the manganese is actually depleted at the same time. And the titanium, which is tracking the insoluble mineral particles, is at a peak right here. So it looks like lithogenic material that could come, for example, from sediment resuspension. And the fact that we have elevated dissolved manganese and reduced particulate manganese and elevated copper to me begins to sound a little bit like a reducing condition in surface sediments. So it's possible that we have a reducing condition somewhere underneath the cavity that's delivering this material in the output. Okay, so this is <clears throat> to reemphasize this whole process is what we call the meltwater pump. And this is sometimes called the ice pump. The physical oceanographers have been referring to this for a while, but not really with respect to chemical constituents. So the idea here is here's the circumpolar deep water flowing in underneath the cavity of the ice shelf, interacting with the ice here in a way that causes melting and makes the water a little bit fresher, not very much. 1.5% meltwater is plenty. And because uh, salinity is such a strong forcer of density, it becomes much less dense and gets buoyant continues to do more melting, but less so up here as the temperature difference between the water and the ice is less. And comes out with this outflow here and the inflow on the east, the outflow on the west. Um, so you could imagine that this inflow is doing a few things. It's melting iron out of the glacial ice. It may be collecting dissolved iron from this near sedimentary environment. It may be collecting suspended iron from the sedimentary environment. You have to remember also this right here is what's called the grounding line, where the bottom of the glacier hits the sediment. And this whole ice shelf is moving like this all the time with the tides. Every hour of every day, it's moving around. And that grounding line is not stable. So the bottom of it is probably scraping across the sediments and lifting off and coming down. There's a lot of activity right there. So it's reasonable to imagine, nobody's really studied this, that there is a physical sediment resuspension mechanism right there. The other thing to say about this that's not shown is if you go backwards here underneath the glacier, the space between the glacier and the continent has plenty of liquid water. There is a whole subglacial hydrologic system there that's been studied by others. And it's thought to be largely reducing. And so probably, we don't have any measurements on this, probably there's some of this subglacial water that's coming squirting out here that may have reduced iron, iron 2 plus, which mixes in with this oxic water and within minutes to hours turns into particulate iron. That is this labile 
form of iron oxyhydroxide that could mix in with lithogenic rock particles that are being resuspended here. So we have lots of possibilities of bringing particles into this upper part. Now I was at a talk at Lamont just a week ago and a graduate student I've got to talk to some more who's at University of Delaware is studying the Peterman Glacier in the Arctic and they had drilled through the ice shelf. This is something that people do um, and I'm, I'm interested in taking samples this way myself but they had just lowered basically a CTD with an optical turbidity measurement and, and they had a movie so it was great. You could actually see the thing going down through the hole. It was like tunneling into the hole and you break through the hole and you can see that and you can see that there's a ton of particulate material coming at you, you know, as the camera is being lowered down. And then they get through a very turbid pot and it gets much clearer when they go down. Um, how is the iron transported from the ice shelf to the polynia? How is it linked to ice shelf dynamics? Uh, how much does the iron support the bloom? And what's the long-term fate of the carbon that's generated by the bloom? So this is something that we're well into now. We published a paper uh, last year, which was a very simple paper um, doing a number of studies using passive tracers within this high resolution 1.5 kilometer scale model that could resolve things like uh, eddies of a few kilometer size within the system. So what we found, satisfyingly enough, was here's, here's our measurements again, and the model reproduced this pretty well, showing us this very strong outflow here, the inflow sort of on the eastern side and deeper with some variability in the middle. And what we tried to do was we tried to assign these different potential sources of iron some end members. So here we have glacial meltwater. So we know how fast the meltwater the meltwater is coming into the cavity, and we gave it an end member of 20-something nanomolar dissolved iron. Same thing with the circumpolar deep water. This is the deep water that I referred to coming onto the shelf from the open uh, ACC. And then we parameterized a sediment source uh, using our data, using our observations. And what the model told us with a passive tracer following each of these is that the distribution of iron through here looked a little bit like what we measured, but the concentrations are not high enough in the outflow and the distribution isn't quite the same if we just attribute it to glacial meltwater. Circumpolar deep water didn't do very much for us in the outflow at all by itself. So uh, although it was uh, made more buoyant by the melting and spot out here, what it carries from off the shelf is a very small contributor to the outflow. What really mattered quite a bit is this sedimentary source iron within the cavity or even brought into the cavity from the open polynia, made more buoyant by the ice melting and then the meltwater pump spitting this sediment source iron out right where we saw it magnified. So the sum of these three gave us a pretty good model-based um, mimic of what we measured. And uh, what we did then was to set up the model and let it run. So this is the, let's see if I can do this. This is the model, whoops, let me start again. This is a model starting in 2006, so well before our observational period. And what it's doing is it's tracing a source of iron from the sediments from the bottom and watching it appear in the upper part of the water column at 150 meters. So think about playing at 150 meters, and when you start to see color, that's when the iron from the sediments is intersecting that plane. And you can see, first of all, that it's a very dynamic system with a lot of eddies, and this sedimentary source is suddenly appearing at the outflow from several different ice shelves, including the Dotson ice shelf here, and it sort of follows along a coastal current, a very high, and this is just a tracer experiment, you can call this iron if you want to, it's treated as a conservative tracer. And you can see that this coastal current generates these eddies that go up into the polynia and back around sometimes and bring this potential source of iron into the polynia. But it's following a, a coastal current and it's strongly influenced by the outflow from the various ice shelves. So the polynia is inheriting sediment source iron from upstream further to the east, coming along the coastal current and ending up in the this is what it looks like if you just run this whole thing. I showed the movie for four more years, up to uh, June of 2010. You can see the sediment source tracer, again, with no removal mechanisms, is occupying a lot of the coastal current. There's a big blob of it, actually, over at the western part of the Polynia. 
and there's quite a bit of it within the Pelini itself, a lot less in the eastern part. So that's just a passive tracer. <clears throat> and this is another representation of the same kind of experiment. So on the bottom, well, first of all, what you're seeing here is a different representation. This is, if you turn your head sideways, here's the Dotson ice shelf, and we're driving out the trough. So this is a section out the Dotson trough from the Dotson ice shelf on the left out to the shelf break on the right. Now, if we run the model with a CDW, circumpolar deep water source of iron, but without the meltwater pump, so we turn off the buoyancy provided by the melting ice, we see very low concentration of iron everywhere, a little bit higher down here where the circumpolar deep water is coming in. Uh, sorry, that's without the meltwater pump here. Very low concentrations of iron. We just turn on the meltwater pump, and the source of iron occupies the elements of sea to a much greater extent than the meltwater pump. It's still not nearly as much as we observe here, and the concentrations up here don't show the biological drawdown, shown in the purple because this is just a conservative tracer. If we do the same thing now for the seventh source iron, here's the observations down here again. Here's without the meltwater pump. We still can't get iron into the upper water column from the sediment source, but if we turn on the meltwater pump, we begin to see it come out here out of the Dotson outflow. And we get higher concentrations generally in the upper water column. And then <clears throat> finally, we spin the bottle up for a number of years with no ice pump, no meltwater pump. We still have low iron everywhere in the surface water that wouldn't be enough to support this bloom. But if we turn on the meltwater pump, now with the full sediment source, the CDW source, and the glacial meltwater, we can see we start to begin to see distributions that resemble what we see in the observations with concentrations over here in the outflow that are getting close to the concentrations we see there. Now this is all just, uh, this was published in 2017, this is all just passive tracer studies. So we're not imparting any chemistry to the iron, but of course iron is a very active element in the ocean, so now we've incorporated a biogeochemical model into the, into the physical model, and this is what it looks like. This is a pretty typical model for nitrogen, where it's got different pools. Here's the dissolved nitrogen, here's the nitrate, for example. Here's the phytoplankton, little p means phytoplankton. Here's some small particles, some big particles. Here's the zooplankton. And we set up a parallel one for iron, which looks pretty simple. We actually simplify it by leaving out the zooplankton. But it's actually quite complicated. You have to figure out in your model what the rates of exchanges among these boxes are and kind of do it responsibly in some way. There are a lot of iron models like this. Some of them include aspects that we don't have here, but we have aspects that others don't have. Uh, and you can see all the parameterizations here. I'm not going to go through them all, don't worry. Um, but we optimize these. So the way we approach this was the first thing we did, actually I say we, but I really mean Hilda Oliver, who's here, who's a PhD student at the um, University of Georgia. She did a 1D model for every station that we had, every station that we occupied. She went to that station, and she said, how does this station change in time? And she imparted things like real winds, observed winds, observed solar radiation, but did it in a 1D sense at each station. The 1D model is very quick to run compared to this very complicated 3D model that takes days for each model run uh, with the supercomputing facilities at ODU. So what she did then was she tweaked parameters to try and get the best match between the model and the data at the exact date that each station was occupied and to tune the model and the biogeochemical model in that way to try to optimize it. And she found some interesting things in the process. So here's the results for a typical uh, mixed layer depth, so middle of the Polinia. And you can see what happens. Uh, for example, here's the dissolved iron. This is an uh, inventory here. Going high, going down low, the gray bars, the three weeks that we were actually there during this fire observing this. So we're in the middle of a long-term drawdown of dissolved iron. Meanwhile, the phytoplankton, this is, this is within the mixed layer, phytoplankton are increasing, the green line are increasing their pool of iron. The small detrital particles, what's getting produced when phytoplankton die, for example, are increasing more slowly and hit a peak late in the growth season. And then the large particles are not much of the total and they hit it very late. If you then look at the sinks, the total sinks per iron, the uptake by phytoplankton, pull the iron out of the dissolved phase. So that's a sink and that happens very quickly and very early in this process. 
and then continues, but at a slower rate, as we decrease iron and, and the growth rate of the phytoplankton slow down. Um, so you can see the iron that comes from scavenging. This is iron that comes from dissolved onto particles in a passive chemical physical way rather than updating to a cell. And you can see the dissolved iron remineralization uh, return to the dissolved phase there as well. So if you look at the same thing, this is what the surface chlorophyll would be doing in the, for this station, increasing and then decreasing. So she's mimicked the bloom in a way that works pretty well with respect to the remote sensing. You can see that the integrated primary productivity through the water column hits a peak early and then decreases. And the reason it decreases is that the light and iron, the light is green, the iron is orange, both of them become limiting quite early in the bloom by our calculations. And this is for, uh, this This is set up for this particular phytoplankton, this colonial phasocystis that's growing. So they are starting out at a level which is, we think, not replete for iron, and they're getting more starved for iron as the bloom develops, and they're definitely getting more limited in light. And the reason is that they're growing to such high biomass that they are self-shading. So the self-shading effect is quite large. And here you see the mixed layer in orange, and you can see it gets shallow when the sea ice disappears. So the sea ice melts and forms a lens of shallow water, and that helps with make the, um, uh, the mixed layer quite shallow. But then it gets deeper again with mixing and winds, and the eupotic zone becomes very shallow because of this cell shading effect. So her model is saying that at a typical station, we have two things going on. And we observe right in the middle of this process that we have dissolved iron availability going down. So these phytoplankton are growing semi-iron starved, but they're also starved for light. So they're actually not doing very well, but they're continuing to accumulate into an even higher biomass after we were there because they're not sinking and because the grazers aren't attacking yet. So now the next stage, the final stage <clears throat> that we got into is we're in the middle of trying to finish a manuscript on this right now to be submitted within a month or so. And um, this is the full-blown 3D model with the biogen chemistry. So this takes quite a bit. If you tell me you want to consider doing a run like this, you really have to think about it hard because if you decide a parameter didn't work right, well, you may not have the money to do it again. So we did this several times for several different reasons. And this is one output, and it's showing dissolved iron and comparing the data output that we measured versus the model output. This is right at the surface, 150, 300, 500 meters. And you can see every dot that you can sort of see here on this scale of dissolved iron concentration is the data that we measured at the surface compared to the model output. So we think that, and the model output here is for the month of December 15th to January 15th, so it's an average distribution for a month. So given that, we think we don't have a bad match at the surface between the model and the data. That's where you see the same color in the interior of the dot as you see in the water surrounding it. And at 150 meters, not bad either. At 300 meters, a pretty good match. Down right near the bottom, our data show a lot of variation in near bottom dissolved iron, which you saw in those very different profiles. A little bit more uniformity in the bottom water dissolved iron concentration. So this gives us some confidence that the model is, the 3D model is mimicking the data reasonably well. So I'm going to show you one more movie here. And this one's complicated because it's like a four ring circus. So let me just start it up if I can. So what, what I'm going to be showing here is there are four boxes all moving at the same time. This is all surface water. Here's the sea ice concentration. All red is 100% sea ice. The blue is the continent, so there's no sea ice there. Here's nitrate concentration, so you'll see the drawdown of nitrate. By the way, this blob that you see here is that big iceberg with all the fast ice making the barrier between this polynia and that polynia. That's actually part of the reason there is a polynia there because of the way that interacts with the physics. And this is the algae, the phytoplankton concentration you'll see here in a minute. And here's the iron concentration. So right off the bat, we're starting here at November 1st. There's the date box right there in yellow. November 1st, 2010, before we got there with the ship. And you can see that the polynia is already occupied with quite a bit of iron. That's a 0.8 nanomolar going down to maybe 0.4. High iron all the way through here. Uh, starting off before the polynia opens up and before the light comes. So it's primed with a quite a variable but high iron concentration, especially near the coast. So let's see what this does. I'm going to try to take this up to about the middle of the time we were actually taking measurements there. 
So here we are, middle of November. You can see the Polina on the upper left starting to open up. On the lower left, you can see that the, oh, oh I'm sorry, look at that. Lower left, you can see the phytoplankton starting to develop. And I'm gonna take this right up to about Christmas if I can do it. Uh, there we are, two days before Christmas. And just to stop it there, you can see what's going on. So the model is telling us that the average Polina situation here is in the dotted line for January, that the Polina has opened up about halfway, and the sea ice has retreated here. The nitrate concentrations have already been drawn down, but in quite a variable way. Uh, and concomitantly, kind of the mirror image of this is the phytoplankton productivity. Again, a lot of small scale variability. And here's the iron concentration in the surface water. So you can see in the eastern part of the Plinia, it's already drawn very early on, about Christmas time, to low levels, but it's still there in higher levels here. So you can imagine this part of the bloom is starting to feel the suffering for iron more than that western part of the bloom. And if you just let this go for the rest of the whole year, ah. so here we are, Christmas time, now we're going into January, and the plane is opening up in the model, you can see what the nitrate is doing, you can see the phytoplankton starting to develop, but then starting to fade already, we're in February, here's the iron, it's all very low through this period, you can see that everything gets messy here late in the season, but then the sea ice starts to come back and closes up the plenia, so of course, no productivity. The nitrate is still not uniform, but quite high in the range of 30 micromolar. And the iron is varying between quite low, maybe 0.1, and all the way up to 0.8 in a very variable way as the year progresses. Now we're in the austral winter in June, and you can see that slowly this coastal current carrying the high iron that's coming from the continuing melting of the glaciers and the meltwater pump is filling up the Polina at the surface with high iron concentrations. And so by the time we get to the end of this, we're in September now, <clears throat> still we're beginning to get the Polina opening up again in the next year. And you can see by that time, end of October, we've got a full year now. We have quite a bit of iron sort of primed into the Polina getting ready for the next season. And you can see its distribution is very variable. And if I compare it to one year before, I'm just gonna click back, that's what it looked like a year before. Also full, but a different distribution. We wouldn't expect the same. But the point is that the meltwater pump's been running all winter and populating the surface waters of this Polina, covered most of the time with sea ice with high concentrations of iron. So that's priming the system for high productivity as soon as the light comes up. And to make this a little easier to look at, here's what the phytoplankton looks like October, November, December, marching through the growing season. And so this is model output showing very much like what the satellite showed with the high phytoplankton in December, really that peak of, of um, primary productivity. In January, remember the productivity is starting to decrease already because of the light and iron limitation. Meanwhile, the physics are carrying this phytoplankton off to the west, so they're sweeping it away from the Polina and even under the sea ice here. In February, it started to decrease. Now you begin to have bracers coming in, and you have phytoplankton dying and sinking, and then by March, there's not much there. So this kind of gives you an idea that it would be interesting to look at the fate of the carbon, so we did that too. The phytoplankton are producing particular organic carbon. Here it is in December, the light stuff, is middle, the red is high. And you can see that the highest flux, this is integrated vertical carbon flux to death, is actually highest west and along the coast, and not in the middle. So we made the mistake of putting a seven trap um, deployed over a year right about there. And we've tried to interpret those data. Now that we have the model, we know that we were really under trapping what had been produced in the water column because it was being swept to the west. The Koreans are quite sure that all of this particular matter is swept right out the trough here and off the shelf into the open ACC. The model is saying that's absolutely incorrect. In fact, the model is saying that not much of this organic matter makes it off the shelf at all. You can see the light blue going off the shelf break a little bit here. But if you think about whether the Amundsen Sea is an exporter of particulate material into the deep water in the open ACC, that would be something closer to a more permanent sequestration of CO2 into the phytoplankton, into the particles and off the shelf, that doesn't seem to be the case. The fate of most of this seems to be trapped 
within the shelf, but it's moving down the shelf with the coastal current towards the Ross Sea. So I'm going to wrap up on a couple slides here. I know there's a lot of uh, output, but there's some interesting things to look at just to give you a feeling for this. So if you take this area, typical area of the average Polina in January, and you just integrate it to depth and make a volume, you can watch iron go in and out of that volume. So here's the dissolved iron flux. Zero right in the middle would be no flux in or out. And each of these lines correspond to a different process. So if you look, for example, at uptake into phytoplankton, the dissolved iron is actually being taken up and it decreases. That's a flux out of the dissolved pool, but not that much. And then it comes back. If you look at the blue, the blue is, sorry, the red, the red is scavenging. So scavenging is the passive process of iron sticking to particles and sinking with those particles in the deep water. The negative flux of iron with scavenging is much, much stronger than the uptake. So most of this iron that's coming into the polina is being passively removed and never going through the biota at all. The green line is lateral flux, so you've got water moving laterally through this volume all the time. And when the dissolved iron pool goes down, more iron comes in from the side. That's what the green line in the positive direction is showing. And then remineralization of the particles um, within the volume is happening in the blue line, so that's pretty significant too. And the dark blue is a net change through the year. So that's what the iron flux is doing. The iron inventory through this whole volume uh, doesn't actually change that much. Here's the whole iron inventory in red. In blue is the dissolved iron, and in green um, is the, uh, the particulate iron biological particulate iron, so there's a trade-off there. If you don't take the whole volume, you just take the upper 100 meters, you get a more exaggerated version of the same thing. And in that case, the dissolved iron really does go decrease in inventory down to maybe a third or a fourth of what it was at the beginning, and then slowly comes back as it's resupplied by the milk water. So <clears throat> we can begin to get insights as to how this system works, and we can take it back to the data which I'm going to do now to finish off. So these are actually our observations. And if you take that same 150 meter slice through our data, okay, not that many stations, this is what you saw before, there's the bloom, remember, out here in the middle, you can kind of get the sense that this coastal current is coming along here, grabbing more iron from the dots and outflow and shooting it out just under the euphotic zone out into this area of the bloom. And if that is maintained over the course of the bloom, now you potentially have a source of iron to keep the bloom going. So this is one idea that we've been thinking about. This time, this is another uh, lateral section. This time I'm going out into these very productive stations that are in the shallower water you can see on the bank here. This is the center of the bloom out here. This is the ice shelf in blue. This is underneath the ice shelf. So here's the high iron coming out. And just by looking at the distributions, you can see that this high iron makes it out to the sub euphotic zone. <coughs> And because the water is mixing vertically, the isopycnal comes up to about 50 meters from the surface in the range where it could, by a strong wind event, which happens every couple of weeks here, be mixed up into the surface, pulsing a new, a new supply of iron up into this euphotic zone. So that's one idea that we've been thinking about, is continual supply from the meltwater pump and periodic mixing into the surface uh, by wind events. But there's probably something else that we have to think about, and this is something that I have some data on that I have not written up and I'm interested in pursuing this more. If you go to this one station, this is where that incubation experiment was done. Station 35, surface nitrate is the lowest we see anywhere, 7 micromolar, still pretty high. Euphotic zone depth is extremely shallow, 10 meters or so, because of all the self-shading. If you look at the dissolved iron, I should do this already, for this particular station, that's what dissolved iron looks like. Mm -hmm. Very low at the surface, actually goes to a little peak right under the euphotic zone. And then you look at the total particulate iron, and it's much, much higher. This is a log scale. So we've got maybe 30 to 50 times as much particulate iron as we have dissolved iron in the system. And this labile particulate iron, which we define chemically, but you could think of as something that at least has the potential for being brought into the dissolved pool, the bioavailable pool, is uh, several times higher than the dissolved, maybe one to two nanomolar in that range. So it's possible that this is a really important pool of iron we haven't thought about enough. And this resident pool of particles, which actually come from the meltwater pump, is sitting there within the euphotic zone. 
<clears throat> slowly being chewed away on by the bloom, being transferred into bioavailable form, growing this big bloom, at which point you would expect this form of particulate iron to be decreased. We don't have any measurements about that. So it's possible that actually the setup of the system at the beginning could be enough to drive this whole bloom if we consider this particulate pool to be an active supply to the phytoplankton. And it turns out that the incubation experiments I talked to you about before, the five experiments she did, the closest correlation to the primary productivity within the bottles was the particulate iron in the bottles, not the dissolved iron. So this is a heads up to be thinking about the potential bioavailability of particulate iron. And by the way, going back to Oscar's talk two weeks ago, if you look at the particulate iron distribution through this whole polynia, in general, it's 10 times higher than anything you see in the Western Iron Peninsula. And that, I think, is because of these fringing ice shelves that bring all of this suspended material from the deep water and connect it to the euphotic zone. So this is the particulate iron possibility as much more of a, um, a potential player in this system than it is in the Western Antarctic. So here's the cartoon of how it all works. Uh, maybe I'll just review this. So here's the circumpolar deep water. It's modified by mixing with the winter water. We call it modified circumpolar deep water. Interacting with the bottom as it comes, picking up dissolved iron, picking up particulate iron by resuspension, heading underneath the ice shelf cavity, probably bringing organic matter with it from the beginnings of the um, bloom or from last year's bloom and putting that underneath the cavity. That's a potential source of organic matter to drive sediment production even underneath the cavity. Then it causes melting, especially near the grounding line, maybe some subglacial water coming in at a lower flux, but potentially high iron concentration. And all this dissolved particulate iron comes out here on the western end at shallow depths, and shallow enough to be mixed into the surface layer with strong gradients up to the surface layer um, to supply iron to An iceberg is probably also important. People have written about this as a source of iron. We did a few measurements near an iceberg. We didn't have time to talk to you about that. The iceberg seemed, from our measurements, not to be affecting the iron profile. What it was was doing a lot of vertical mixing by moving laterally through the system. So it's possible that you get frequent enough icebergs going through this polynia, and they happen a lot. That could be another way of mixing deeper water up into the surface to augment what the wind is doing. So the last thing I'll show, this is the last slide really, to the conclusions, is something in the future. What we'd really like to do is to be able to get underneath this cavity and to sample closer to where the action is happening, closer to the grounding line. And in some sense, that's been done. Um, so this is the first, this is my colleague Pierre uh, Duchroux, who's at Lamont. And last April, he was the first one to fly a glider and also to deploy floats that went underneath the Dotson Ice Shelf. There's the cavity in white here. You can see the track, which all the tracks they did with the glider, some of them back and forth outside the ice shelf face, a couple of missions underneath. They definitely didn't get to the grounding line, which is back here. This is the ice shelf elevation below sea level, so about 550 meters below sea level there, shallower here. Um, and these dotted lines you can see here, this is where a float went in and took two or three years to go in this far and then come back out shallow, following the track of the circumpolar deep water. So he's got measurements of temperature and salinity and unfortunately not particle concentrations on these particular deployments. But it's interesting to see what's happening in this ice base elevation. This yellow and red shows you where a trough has been melted in the roof of the cavity. So it's an inverse trough like this. And the redder it is, the closer up to the surface it goes. So this meltwater has been coming out for decades, carving a trough of preferred motion high up in the cavity and then coming out in the shallow area where we see it coming out. So where I'm headed with this is that, and this is what I was talking to Pierre about last week, it would be great to deploy a device like this that could measure iron distributions and particle concentrations here. The only way to do that right now is to make a mini sampler that can sample in time series as a glider or some AUV goes underneath, and that's something I'm thinking hard about right now. So just to summarize, um, I didn't say anything about macrofauna, but that's a picture from our cruise. That can see them. Um, so the circulation, the melting within the ice shelf cavities is really key, we think, to the iron supply that keeps this intense, long-lasting bloom going and makes the opposite sea polynia so much more productive than the other polynias. 
The glacial meltwater itself, we think, can only supply about 25% of the iron, dissolved iron that we measure in the outflow. <clears throat> we think that the sediment derived both dissolved and particulate iron, whether that sediment is coming from within the cavity or brought into the cavity combined with meltwater and shot back out, or whether it's related to output from the subglacial system between the glacier and the continent, we don't know. It's an interesting question. But the sedimentary particulate iron is really high, and it may be that there's a lot of physical activity right near the, the uh, grounding line that's generating more physical energy to cause resuspension than happens anywhere else in the cavity. Um, we seem to show evidence from the little bit of other trace metal chemistry that we can interpret that there may be reducing conditions associated with this output. And the take home message is really the meltwater pump. What it's doing primarily is adding buoyancy to a benthic body of water, which allows it to come up into the upper part of the water column and be relevant to the phytoplankton. Thanks. Again? It seemed to be dominated by colonial physicists. Yep. Yeah. Um, that would make like a huge difference. Yeah, that's a very good point because we, in our model, we've got quite a high half saturation concentration for iron, which comes from a paper from a few years ago, and it's about 0.26 was the number nanomole. That's really hot compared to a lot of other especially small phytoplankton cells like that 0 0.1, 0 0.05. In fact, single phaeocystis a much lower requirement for, um, for iron concentrations for growth. So we don't know. We were there for a three-week window. We don't know what happened in the middle of the plenum before that, what happened after that. We are The model is set on the assumption that colonial phaeocystis is dominating the system from beginning to end. Gosh. Uh, Rob, do you get any sense? You mentioned how the importance of that coastal current for replenishing the iron supply in the winter, no. and potentially also mm -hmm. during the growing season. Is there any evidence that upstream pollinias are also providing phytoplankton productivity to that area as well, or is it all? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it kind of depends. I mean, the upstream pollinia is a pine island. And you would have to get upper water column water into the Amundsen Sea Polynia. And I think the Thwaites ice tongue and the grounded iceberg and the fast ice make a pretty good barrier to the upper water column moving through there. So that's a really good question. I'll have to talk to Pierre if you consider that. But my first gut answer is no, it's not significant. And certainly in the model, the model is for the whole embayment. And I didn't show the results for the pine island, but we have the phytoplankton growing there as well in the model. So the model would show them coming in. Hmm. I gotta look, I gotta look into that. That's an interesting question. Lee? So all this phytoplankton isn't exported out, it must go to the sediments, yeah. And get respired and eaten there by invertebrates and stuff. And yeah. is it possible that not just dissolved iron is being you know, brought back up to the upper water column, but is there any possibility that kind of a sleep phytoplankton cells might make it up to? A sleep, did you say? Yeah. Yes. Ah. You know, like, you're going to get a big yeah. rain of this <clears throat> down into the sediments. You know, there is a them ton over of winter and basically yeah. make it all back up, kind of along with Josh was saying. Well, to address that question, we deploy two different kinds of sediment traps. I didn't talk about that data at all. And the Koreans have deployed sediment traps, but they're really focused on the outer part of this trough, where we don't think the action is, actually. And the sediment traps that we deployed, which were a ways off, sort of in the, in the southern end, the bloom area, off of the Dawson Ice Shelf, north of the western edge, um, we, did, we had a year-long sediment trap deployed at 350 meters. Up of that, that effort. And then <clears throat> Tishager and I um, deployed floating sediment traps, 60 meters, 150 meters, 300 meters, deployed for just two to four days, as long as we could, roughly in that same vicinity. And so those are very short snapshots of flux. But what we found with that in those traps was really interesting. Apparently, if you take a vertical model, we had tremendous loss of POC flux with depth. 
So even by 60 meters, you're significantly lower than what we would model for the surface. Between 60 and 150, you've lost three quarters of it. So there's a tremendous amount of remineralization happening in the water column or lateral flux that we didn't account for. And then you go down to 300 meters and there's another chunk. So actually, we think that, yeah, certainly there's accumulation on the sediments, but most of this POC and sinking whole phytoplankton cells are remineralized, largely by bacteria, we think. The zooplankton activity, well, we would love to know what it is late in the season. The model says that the zooplankton really take off in February and March. We have no observations. So. But it's colonial forms, it's probably microzooplankton dominating, not, not meso. Yeah. Yeah. And we have measurements of microzooplankton. And there's activity during this observation period, but it's all well below the euphotic zone. So their grazers are not active in the euphotic zone. And resistance may be good at chemically protecting itself. How do you resolve various function of melt rate? Do you have a sense of how that could change if the melt rate increases? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we know the melt rate has changed from year to year. Let me see if I can show you a slide. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. go ahead. It's okay, I know it's late, I went long. If you look at the black line here, here's the dots of meltwater flux as estimated by glaciologists. Not every year, but it's going from 2000 to 2016. You see it went through a sort of big multi-year peak and then down. And the reason for this is that the temperature above freezing of the deep water that's interacting has changed a lot. So you get changing fluxes of certain polar deep water, changing temperatures, and that seems to, that thermodynamic difference, it seems to be the primary driver. If you then look, we've asked this question, look at the elements and see annual productivity from Kevin Arrigo's measurements of remote sensing. Eh, there's a little bit of a sense that it's generally higher here than there and there, but I wouldn't call that much of a correlation. So I think that um, we have too many other things going on uh, governing productivity here. And that's mixed layer depth and light. So all of these things have to be considered. The, the iron is certainly important, but I wouldn't say this much more melting is gonna give you this much more iron flux, and it's gonna give you that much more productivity. In fact, we know what's happening, and what we expect to happen is the sea ice is retreating in general. So it, if it retreats earlier and then comes back later, you've lengthened the growing season with respect to light, right? We actually did a little simulation of that with <coughs> a, a 1D model. And so we just said, well, here's the control situation in red. Here's the algal biomass, the primary productivity, et cetera. Let's say the sea ice melts not too far in the future. It may be melting two weeks earlier. And so not surprisingly, we melt the sea ice two weeks earlier. We've got enough light now that the phytoplankton can take advantage of that. And the bloom starts earlier and peaks earlier. The fall off looks very similar, which is interesting. The blue line is just another experiment with no melt water pump. So it's basically turning off the iron supply is important. And the mixed layer depth uh, uh, changes. The green is the new one uh, here. So that's different because the sea ice is making the mixed layer depth. The sea ice melting is making it shallower earlier, so it created a good situation for phytoplankton blooming, but the light's not up very strong yet at this point. And the total carbon export increases. So they might expect in the near future that the spalina becomes more productive, sends more carbon down into the deeper water and becomes more productive overall. But there's probably a limit to this because if you had no sea ice, you just take it to its limit and you treat it like some of the plinias around the northern part of Greenland on both sides, which are basically not seasonal bolinias anymore. They're open all the time. If that were true, then you would still have the meltwater pump putting all the iron in, but you wouldn't have the retreating sea ice opening up the polinia, adding its buoyancy, freshwater melting to the surface water and helping to make the mixed layer shallow enough that the phytoplankton can take advantage of that. So I think if you opened up the polinia way early, what you would get is a situation where the wind is mixing continuously the whole situation looks like near the ice shelf face, where there's a lot of vertical deep mixing. And you just can't generate a bloom in those situations. So I think ultimately, you might through through a higher productivity, but then ultimately crash to a much lower productivity. That's kind of our expectation. Thanks, guys.